The witness may be sworn in. Sir, please state your full name, Mr. Garepo. My name is Oscar Leonard Carl Pistorius. Do you have any objection in taking the prescribed vote? I don't, my lady. Do you consider the prescribed vote to be binding on the conscience? I do, my lady. Do you say that the evidence about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, raise your right and see to help me go. So help me God. What must this one in my lady? Thank you. Will you need she? You may be seated if you so wish. Um, here's a Yes, Mr. Roo. Thank you. Mr. Pistorius, when I explained to you that your evidence would be presented by dealing with your background and moving on, you mentioned that there's something that you want to do first. Yes. What is that, Mr. Pistorius? Um, my lady, if I may just please start off with my evidence by tendering an apology. What is the apology that you want to tender, Mr. Pistorius? Um, I, haven't, um, I would like to take this opportunity. Um, to apologize to um, Mrs. and Mr. Mr. Stiankamp, to Reva's family, to um, those of you who knew her who are here today, family um, and Mr. Pistorius? friends, man. Yes, I, I don't like doing this to you, but I, I can hardly hear you. I'm, I, I beg your pardon, my lady, I'll speak up. I'd like to apologize and say that there's not a moment, and there hasn't been a moment. Um, since, since this tragedy happened and I haven't thought about uh, your family, I wake up every morning and you're the first people I think of, the first people I pray for. I can't imagine the, the pain and the sorrow and the emptiness that I've caused you and your family. Uh, I was simply trying to protect Riva. I can promise that when she went to bed that night, she felt loved. I've tried to put my words on paper many, many times to write to you, but no words would ever suffice. Mr. Pistorius, I, I know you want to face Mrs. Steenkamp when you apologize, but there's one difficulty, and, and that is that the court must hear you, must be in a position to hear you, and the only way we can do it is you talk in the direction of a ladyship. Will, will it be possible to do that? <coughs> Mr. Pistorius, are you on medication? Um, yes, my lady, I've been on medication since last year, um, um, about the third week of February. Um, I've changed my medication over the course of the last... Uh, over the course of the last 14 months. What, what medication do you use? Um, I, was, I was put on um, an antidepressive called uh, Supramol. And uh, in, in uh, the beginning of last year, I started taking a sleeping sedative called, uh, called Normacin. And later on, um, I, changed, I got my medicine changed to a, a medicine called uh, Ciprolex and um, Dormanoct and Molipaxin, my lady. Do you, do you have a difficulty in sleeping? Uh, I do, my lady. Um, um, I'm scared to sleep. 
For, for, for several reasons, but uh, I have I have terrible nightmares about about things that happen at night where I wake up and I smell I can smell um, I can smell uh, blood and I wake up to being terrified. Um, <laughs> if I hear a noise, I wake up. Uh, just in a, in, a, in a complete state of terror, um, to a point that I'd rather not sleep than um, than fall asleep and, and wake up like that. So, for for many weeks I didn't sleep. And I, um, in uh, March, April last year, I'd lost a significant amount of weight and um, from my care of my family. Um, I uh, sought medical advice to um, to to start um, medication for for sleeping. <laughs> you told me finding getting into a cupboard. Can you tell the court about that? Um, Um, I, I, I can't remember if it was towards the end of last year or the beginning of this year. I woke up in a, in a panic, and um, I'm, I'm blessed that my sister stays on the same property as I do, so I can phone her in the middle of the night, which I often do, to come and sit by me. And um, on that particular night, uh, I don't obviously ever want to handle a firearm again or be around a uh, firearm, so I've got a a security guard that stands outside of my front door at night. But I woke up and I was terrified and I, um, I for some reason couldn't calm myself down. So uh, I, I climbed into the cupboard and I phoned my sister to come and sit by me for a while, which she did. Money. Mr. Pistorius, going to your background, when were you born? My lady, may I please be seated? Yes, please take a seat. I was born in um, I was born on the eleventh of twenty uh, second of November, nineteen eighty six, in Johannesburg. And your family situation? How many siblings? Where do you fit in? Um, I'm the middle child. I have, um, I've got two siblings. I've got a brother who's 18 months older than I am, and I've got a sister who's 24 months younger than I am. And the relationship between you and your brother and your sister? We've we've grown up very close. My family's uh, we're a tight knit family. The situation with your parents. Um, my parents, my my parents um, separated when I was young, and my mother passed away when I was 15. How old were you when your mother passed away? I was 15, my lady. Now, as as a child, as a little child, uh, could you explain and sketch to the court your situation at the, at home? What was the relationship with your mother? What was the relationship with your father? I grew up in a, in a loving home. Um, my father wasn't often around. He, uh, he's, he works, he's always worked very, uh, you know, away from home. So we grew up mostly with my mother. With my mother and um, she was a very caring, uh, soft-hearted nature person. Um, she was a she was a fantastic parent. Um, when my parents got separated when I was young, um, we didn't have uh, our financial means were, were were very difficult. But with the help of our extended family, um, we were never made to feel like we needed anything. Um, my mother worked at a government high school as a secretary, and so we got the holidays with her. Um, through arts, the period from when I was in primary school, so six to 
uh, high school, um, seven, sorry, seven to, to high school. We, we grew up with my mother and um, we moved around a fair deal. Um, and uh, my mother got remarried when, when I was uh, 14. How old were you when your parents separated? Um, I was six, six years old. <coughs> We know about the difficulty with your legs. Could you explain to the court exactly what that is? Um, I wouldn't say there's a difficulty with my legs. I'd say that I've, I'm, I've got prosthetic legs that allow me to help me to overcome those disabilities or those difficulties. It's a difficulty would be when I don't have my, my legs on. I don't have balance. Um, I have very limited mobility. Meaning what I rather mean, Mr. Pistorius, when you were born, what was the situation? I mean, it's, I know it's hearsay, but we will come in with from the point that you know. Um, uh, when I was when I was born, I had a missing. I was born with a born def with a birth defect, so I was born with missing fibula, which is one of the two bones between the knee and the, the knee and the ankle. Um, and were you my, missing fibula on both sides? I was missing fibula on both legs, and um, my my parents consulted with many medical practitioners, and they thought that the best would be to amputate my leg between both my legs between the ankle and the knee joints. Um, they did so when I was 11 months old, and when I was 13 months old, I got my first uh, prosthetic leg, which was a conical shape. It wasn't really a prosthetic leg with a foot, um, but I learned how to um, to stand up with them and to move around. And uh, I walked when I was 17 months old, and then on really uh, fairly regular intervals, I I had to get prosthetics made because um, I was growing and. Uh, the technology they had in, 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 in those days wasn't very good, so um, it didn't allow. The prosthetic feet just weren't very comfortable, so I got them done uh, fairly regularly. What was your mother's approach to you not, you, with you born with this disability? My mother was uh, very supportive. She, I remember when my brother went to school, um, she said to me that she wasn't going to, she was a bit um, carefree. She said she wasn't going to do two trips, so I must find a sport to do. And she never made me feel any difference to the rest of the kids. She um, she didn't ever want me to see my disability as a as um, something that should hold me back. So she she um, she just kind of allowed me to pursue uh, sports and things, and she didn't chase after me. You know, she, if I fell, she left me to get up for myself, and she didn't baby me. She treated me exactly the same as my, as my brother and my sister. Where did you go to for primary school purposes? I uh, attended primary school um, at Constantia Cliff Primary uh, School on the West Rand. And uh, during your time at the primary school, was there any difficulties with the disability? Um, the prosthetic legs that I had then were very heavy, um, so they didn't really allow me to be as mobile as, as I was at later years when the technology got better, but um, it was, I guess it was difficult. Um, you know, kids always, I think, uh, they, they, they don't always uh, know. It's not that they, they're just untainted when it comes to opinions and something that's different isn't always, the, you know, that isn't the norm as seen as, as something that needs to be explored. So I think that was difficult for me to adapt. I'd grown up not thinking I was any different and then met, uh, you know, surroundings where I was treated differently, but over time people's perceptions of me changed because they saw how I viewed myself. So they didn't. Um, you know, they, they didn't see me as being any different at times. Did you encounter during primary school any difficulty with the other children? 
on a, on a couple of occasions, but it was never... Such as? Um, uh, there were just one or two occasions where I got uh, bullied or uh, pushed around, but my parents, um, you know, they always taught me to stick up for myself. And um, Meaning I, if you go home now and you tell your mother or your father that you were bullied that day by another child, what, what would their approach be or your mother's approach be? My, my family uh, have always believed in standing up for yourself and for uh, standing up for what you believe in. I come from a family um, where we were taught that uh, we don't come, you know, cry to our parents at the end of the day. So my mother, there was, I remember a situation where my buttons got torn off my shirt and my mother sent me to school the next day and said to me that I must get my, you know, that if my shirt came back that way the next day, um, it uh, should send it home with the other kids' um, parents. and. It happened the next day, and I got called into the headmaster's office for... Uh, Why? What was wrong with you? I stood up for myself, and I, I got into a physical altercation with this other kid. Uh, and um, when I got called in, my mother arrived, and she just basically said to the headmaster that she doesn't think that it's wrong for her kids to stand up for what they believe in and for getting bullied, and that she wouldn't be back. And she gave the shirt to the kids' parents and, and, and told them to bring it back when it was when it was repaired. What type of sport did you participate in at primary school? Uh, my lady, I did most sports. Uh, I didn't. I wasn't very good at any of them, but I tried most of them. Uh, I tried football and cricket, and then I started tennis um, when I was about ten, and I I played fairly well. Um, I enjoyed. I just enjoyed many sports. We so did many sports outside of school. My my brother and I did uh, canoeing and wrestling, and um, we were just taught to. Or um, you know, my mother wanted us to be um, more rounded and experience. You know, get over my physical limitations by experiencing different sports. Your mother did. She, did she have any security concerns? Yeah. Um, mm. My mother had a lot of security concerns. Um, we obviously grew up in a family where uh, my father wasn't around much, so my mother, she, she had a pistol. Um, and um, she would often get scared at night and she would phone, phone the police. We didn't stay in the best of suburbs and there was often crime in the area. Um, on a couple of occasions they did break into our home, but more than often than not, uh, it was just her being scared, and so she'd come, you know, at night and call us to go sit in her room. And many times we'd just wait for the for the police to arrive. Mr. Storis, can you speak up a little bit, if possible, please? Where did she keep her firearm, for instance? My lady, she kept her firearm um, on a on a um, under her bed, uh, under, and in a just under her pillow, in a in a padded um, in a padded leather type of bag. You said something about pillow, I could not hear you. Sorry, she kept her firearm in a in a in a in a padded uh, bag under her pillow. And in your where did you go to high school? I went to boarding school at Pretoria Boys High. How did that happen that you went to boarding school? Um, in my standard five year I wanted to um, oh. wanted to go to a boarding school and um, I'd been with a friend of mine who was at Constantia Clough Primary with me to watch one of his older brothers play cricket uh, on a Saturday afternoon. And uh, I accompanied him and I fell in love with the school and what it had to offer. And uh, when I got home, I discussed it with my mom and I said to her, if I could, I'd really like to go to, to uh, that school. <laughs> and she discussed it with family members of mine and um, the next year, the following year, I went. So I started attending Pretoria Boys High, and my my brother moved schools and, and joined me there. And at high school, what was your relationship with the other scholars? Um, I had a mixed group of friends. So I, many of them I still speak to today. Um, 
I wasn't a part of any specific group. I had, I had uh, friends that were very um, talented uh, in sports and other friends that were very gifted academically. Um, and I was pretty much just seen as a as one of the one of the I guess one of the boys. Um, I started sport fairly on, and I was never really much of an academic, but uh, I tried to do my best, and and um, I enjoyed the time I had there. What what sport did you participate in? It. Um, I did I did rugby and water polo, and then at a later stage I moved over to athletics. I did rugby and water polo, my lady, and at a later point I moved over to athletics. When did you move over the, over to athletics, and um, how did it come about? I'd, I'd been playing a rugby game in, uh, in my uh, Form 3 year, which was standard 8, and um, I'd had a knee injury, and part of my sport rehabilitation, um, I was seeing a biokineticist at the University of Pretoria, and um, he suggested to me that I meet with a, with a coach at the uh, university. Um, to help with my fitness, and so I met with him. Um, it was in uh, September 2003, about, and um, we had a chat. And um, in January 2004, I started training with him, and I was supposed to train with him for for four months, and then go back to rugby. And um, he uh, he asked me to participate in a, in a disabled athletics meeting in in Durban in the end of March, and um, I'd never participated in, in a disabled event before, so um, I was maybe a bit hesitant in the beginning. I didn't know what to expect, and I hadn't grown up with a, with feeling like I had a disability. Um, I went down and I, I ran the events, and I came back up. Um, and I started rugby, and about two weeks in, um, this coach phoned me and he said to me, would I like to go run in America at a Paralympic event? And I've never been overseas before, so I, I, um, I took up the opportunity. And when I got back uh, that same year in 2004, my name was on the, on the South African team for the Paralympics. And so I went to the Paralympics and I, I discovered Paralympic sports for the first time. And, um, I knew that that's, you know, one thing that I'd really love to get involved in, and I never went back to any other sport after that. I focused on athletics, and then in my matric year, I started the 400 meters, um, and in that year, I went to the Able Body Senior Championships in Durban, and I ran, ran there, and I ran fairly well, and then it just progressed from there on out. Now. You said that your mother passed away when you were 15. What effect did that have on you? Um, if you could maybe just give more about your relationship with your mother and, and the effect of, of her passing. Um, my mother was a very important person to, to, um, to us, to my brother and sister and I. Um, although my parents got... Uh, divorced when I was, when I was quite young. Um, my, my father's family, they kept in close contact with her. They were, she had a loving relationship with all of them. And um, I mean, we spent all our time with her. Everything we, we learned in life, I learned from, from her. Um, and when she passed away, it was very unexpected. It was, uh, I'd just started boarding school. She'd just got married, uh, remarried. And um, um, uh, we didn't even, my brother and I didn't even know she was sick. We, we, uh, we were just informed. We hadn't been home for, uh, sometimes on the weekends as a boarder, you stay in at the hostel. So we weren't informed that she was sick, and by the time we were, she was already uh, in a coma. And then for about a two-week period, I think, back and forth, uh, there were some days where, where she got, uh, where the doctors wanted us to go through, so we'd leave school in the middle of the day and, and go through to Johannesburg where she was. And um, 
we'd sit by her and then the other day she got better and we'd go back to school and it kind of carried on and then uh, the one day they phoned us and they said we must rush to to Johannesburg and uh, I think we were there for about 10 minutes before she passed. After after her passing, where did you reside? I know you attended boarding school but what about the weekends? Um, on the weekends... And, and school holidays? The weekends... Um, we all, uh, my brother, sister and I, kind of, uh, my sister was staying with my, with my godmother, my, my mom's sister, my aunt in Johannesburg. She finished school at Constantia Cliff and uh, she started attending a high school in Johannesburg. So um, my brother and I would kind of do our, our own thing on the weekends. We'd stay at uh, family or friends. Um, we'd stay with my dad's brother, my uncle or my mom's sister in Johannesburg. Or we'd just stay with friends and we we'll stay in at hostel. We wouldn't really uh, stay anywhere in particular. And during school holidays? And school holidays, we'd, we'd usually go um, to a family's, uh, to a family or a friend's house um, and spend time with them. Some holidays we'd spend with my father on Christmas. Um, we didn't see much of him at that point. He'd, uh, after my mom's passing, he'd moved down to the Cape. So we saw him maybe once or twice a year. But we, we got a close extended family and so if we weren't with friends we were with them. Now when did when did you really become seriously involved in athletics? Um, I really enjoyed I enjoyed athletics. Um, I started uh, in my first year, I got a bursary at the University of Pretoria and um, I started running for the university. Um, I got offered to run internationally for South Africa in, on a Paralympic level, but I wasn't making my classes. I was struggling uh, to find time to balance uh, academic, academically and, and uh, on the sporting front. And it was pretty much in that year that I had to make a decision that uh, if I wanted to do this, I'd have to make a, a living out of it. And so um, I tried to to uh, to turn professional at that point, but there was there wasn't much uh, there wasn't much uh, money in Paralympic sports at the time, so it was a bit of a struggle. Um, <laughs> but I, I I carried on with it, and I'd say that's more or less the point that I that I started taking it uh, far more seriously. At that point in time, did you only compete in, at the Paralympics level or at the disabled level or also able level? Uh, since I started athletics, I mostly only competed on an able body level. I participated in um, meetings which were regional meetings, uh, uh, Hateng North meetings and some provincial meetings. Um, and then on the odd occasion when there were Paralympic or disabled meetings for athletes with amputees, I would participate with them. Um, it just so happened that as my times got better every year and I, I was more and more diligent with my work um, ethic, that in 2007 I had the opportunity to run internationally for the first time abroad. And that's when I started running uh, able body uh, races competitively internationally. And with regard to the prosthetic legs, was there any advancement there? Any improvement? Uh, on, the, on the running prosthetics? Um, on the running prosthetic legs, the, the legs that I started running with, um, they had been out um, for several years. By the time I started using them, I think for about 10 years, and although there has been a lot of advancement um, in, in Paralympic sprinting, um, there are certain brands which you may use, um, but um, the one that I'm, I'm with, um, there's no advancement or technology um, that they've improved upon there. Now, if you can take the court through the progress in your athletic career, um, when do you say that you really started to excel to...? Um, I'd, uh, my lady, I'd, I think in 2000 and 2009 probably. Um, 
Iran in Athens. I ran uh, 2004 at the Paralympic Games in Athens. In 2005, I came um, sixth in South Africa, able body at the senior championships. I was the sixth, sixth fastest or sixth highest ranked athlete in the country over the 400 meters. Um, then in 2006, um, I went to the World Championships for Athletes with Disabilities in Assen in the Netherlands. Um, I won multiple golds there. In 2007, I ran in the South African National Championships again, the Senior Championships, Able Body Championships in, in Durban, and I finished second. And then 2008 um, was a difficult year because I was busy with a lot of the testing and, and uh, I, had a, I had a court case with the prosthetic legs that I run on to prove that they didn't uh, provide any advantage. So I was busy for many months, um, not on the track as I would have liked to have been, but I missed the, I missed the Olympic game qualification by... Why, why did you miss it? I just didn't have enough time to train. So, um, what, what was the problem with your legs, the prosthetic legs? I'd started, although many Paralympic athletes had used the exact same prosthetic leg for for many, many years, there were none that ran the speeds that I ran. And because I wanted to run internationally um, and qualify for the Olympics, there was a dispute between the International Athletic Federation that monitored our sport, that monitors our sport and, um, and myself. And um, I obliged and did testing um, which they asked me to do in, in Cologne in uh, November 2007. And they came back and they said that I had an advantage using the prosthetic legs that I ran on. Uh, we did two days of testing and, and there were no uh, tests done on the actual prosthetic leg itself. So um, I decided to dispute it and in order to do so um, I had to be the subject of a lot of testing and I had to spend um, many weeks in America during 2008 doing testing at uh, Rice University which is in Houston and um, it was a joint effort with um, some scientists from around America and international scientists and with the information that was gathered they found that <coughs> I didn't have an advantage uh, using the prosthetic leg that I run on and so we took it to the Court of Arbitration for Sports um, in, in early 2008 and um, their finding was a unanimous decision that the prosthetic leg didn't provide an advantage but at that point I only had about a month and a half left to qualify for, for Beijing so um, I missed the qualification by less than a quarter of a second and it was a it was a devastating time for me because I really, it was a a goal of mine that I'd really set myself on and um, I really I started working considerably harder after that every year I was trying to find ways to improve myself to be better to be more focused to be lighter to be stronger but after 2008 I started from scratch I got uh, new training personnel I got I kept the same coach uh, since I began um, athletics and I still still got him <coughs> Um, and and I just started working harder and harder. And then in 2009, I ran some international able body races. In 2010, the same. In 2011, I represented um, South Africa at the at the World Championships, and um, we broke the 4x400 meter relay uh, South African record. We got a silver in the final. Um, and personally, I, I got to the semi-final, and then in 2012, I ran, uh, represented South Africa in the Olympic and Paralympic Games. Did you experience any difficulties, uh, physical difficulties, in your running career? Um, I think every athlete, uh, professional athlete, has difficulties with injuries, with travelling, with uh, with priorities. Um, I guess uh, with, with uh, pr running with prosthetics there's often medical problems that come associated with um, fatigue of certain muscle groups um, I had a lot of problems with skin, with skin irritation inside of my prosthetic legs um, 
you know, just uh, there'd be times that my the skin on my stump would come off because of the amount of running we'd do. So I'd run with a uh, like b- bandage that was uh, just blooded, and then I'd just rewrap it. And but when you took it off, it would just pull the skin off again. So um, there were were sometimes difficulties with travelling and with with those sort of things. What what difficulties with travelling? Um, the prosthetic leg that I wear has got a high back, so if you sit confined in a confined space um, with your knee at a, an acute angle, um, it cuts off blood circulation from the back, so you can get blood clotting, which I got on, on several um, flights. Some of them involved hospitalization on landing, um, but that was you know, on, on rare occasions, but um, traveling is always a having prosthetic legs um, you know if on long if on long trips I if I'd been had an evening flight I'd be wearing my prosthetic legs the entire day and at night I'd want to take them off to let my my stumps breathe um, but if you're catching an international flight you have to be careful because if uh, if something happens on the plane you know I'd, I wouldn't have the luxury of putting on my legs quick enough um, but having a uh, prosthetic leg on it doesn't breathe very well um, the, um, so you just get skin irritation problems and things like that so you have to be very careful with traveling um, as far as um, as far as skin and 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 health issues if you're on your stumps what is your balance like I don't have balance on my stumps. Um, I can stand on my stumps. I can't stand still on my stumps. Um, I put my prosthetic legs next to my bed. When I wake up in the morning, I put them on. Um, and when I go to bed at night, I take them off. So I, I seldom don't. I seldom have a time when I am not wearing my prosthetic legs. On the odd occasion, I'd. If I'm in my room, I wouldn't put them on if I just wanted to stretch or if I wanted to fetch something in a close, close proximity, but I don't have a uh, very good balance. I don't have a ankle joint, so I don't have articulation of the ankle and I don't have balance as a, on, a, on a foot, on a heel to toe. So, um, is, is there a difference between your left leg and your right leg? Uh, on my stubs? On um, the heel pad specifically? Yes, on my, on my stumps. Um, the operation that I had, the operations that I had as a, as a, as a infant, um, they removed my heel pad from my, my foot and they put it onto the bottom of my stump. And um, as I've got older, or as I grew, um, the bone below my knee grew. And so the heel pad... Um, was supposed to stay at the bottom, but it's rotated. It's rotated as the bone's grown around the back. Um, and it's worse on the left side to the point that I've spoken to my surgeon over the last couple of years to to redo uh, the left stump, m- move the heel pad so that there's soft tissue on the bottom of the bones that I can walk on my stumps better. Um, but I wouldn't have time to take off of my athletic career um, in order to do so. But it, uh, the length is similar. The, the right stump um, is about a centimeter longer than the left. But um, because of the heel pad moving on the left stump, I can't place weight on on my left stump. So I have to rotate my entire leg, my knee joint, out to the left when I walk without my prosthetic legs on. And what does that do to your balance? Um, it just throws my weight off completely. It, um, I don't have balance as such. If I have to stand without holding onto something, um, without my, with on my stumps, I have to move around continuously. So I mean, my if uh, if on a Saturday or Sunday morning I was lying in my room and my dog came into my room, it, my dog could knock me over without my without my prosthetic legs on. You competing in. The level that you did, did it bring you into contact with any charitable work and to what extent? Um, it 
in my athletic career, I was in contact with a lot of charitable work. Um, from uh, 2004, I got involved in a, in a foundation initially run by Rotary. It was in Mozambique. Um, I went out and I spent some time with, with uh, people who'd been maimed by landmines, who'd, been, who'd lost their legs from landmines. Um, we, uh, we did some clinics up there, um, and as a result, we formed a foundation called the Soul of Africa and Mind Seeker. Um, there were many patrons, or there were several patrons on both the foundations, which included um, celebrities and presidents and things. Um, Nelson Mandela was a patron of our foundation. Um, and the work that we did was to provide medical assistance to people that had lost their, their legs from landmines. And one, one of the things that we found was that many of the people that had lost their legs hadn't lost it as a result of the war. They'd lost it in the last couple of years. So there were teenagers and young adolescents that weren't able to walk, um, who'd never been involved in the war. And through this, um, over the years, I started doing more and more projects. Uh, initially, I'd just go and I'd show the people that having a disability, you know, you could still have lead a normal life and, and lead a life where you could contribute in your society so to subsistence farm in the very rural areas. And then later on, um, it was just about changing people's perceptions. In Mozambique, where I did most of, where I do most of my work, the people are embarrassed about having a disability. So one day I went to the local radio station and I called for the fastest people in the town, it was in Villanculos, to come and race me. And um, we set out a road, piece of the road, we got the municipality to close off the road. And I raced the fastest guys in the town and I won. And all the people who had prosthetic legs all of a sudden weren't ashamed of having prosthetic legs. They all started pulling up their pants and showing everybody else that, look, I've also got a prosthetic leg. And what started off there with being you know, a simple project turned into something um, that I found uh, very important to myself. And about three, four years ago, um, I approached the University of Glasgow. Uh, they've got a special materials department there, which is one of the best in the world. They do a lot of aerospace um, work. And they allowed me uh, pretty much full reign of their engineering departments and I came up, I designed and came up with a prosthetic foot for Africa. It's a foot that can't melt if somebody falls asleep next to a fire, um, which many times is the case in, in Africa. A lot of the feet that were being built were very heavy. They weren't durable. They cost a lot of money. So I wanted to, I had a criteria of things that I wanted to uh, overcome by developing this foot. And um, together with the university, we developed a foot and... Um, for that, I received my, my an honorary doctorate last year or the year before. From 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 the University of, of Strathclyde in, in Glasgow. And that was for for my work, um, my humanitarian work, and in, in the work in prosthetics and prosthetic developments. Now, becoming more involved in athletics, did it have any impact on your friendships? Um, it, it definitely did. I mean, I. I had less time to spend with with my friends. Um, I was away from home for uh, seven, eight months of the year. I think in 2012 I had just over 100 international flights between May and December. Uh, it had a huge effect on perceived friends. I started earning a decent amount of money. Um, so it changes a lot of the dynamics in, in a person's life. Um, you obviously get to experience many amazing things that I'm very blessed and very lucky for, but it's hard to come back after not seeing people after five or six months and they're dating different partners or they're engaged or, and to bring them up to speed is sometimes not, not always easy. So it did change a lot of the friendships that I had. <coughs> Now, you were also involved in a boating accident. When was that, Mr. Pistorius? 
um, a lady that was in uh, 2009. Um, I, uh, I was, at the time, I was injured. I had athletics injury. And um, um, on that day, on the Friday night, I went down to watch um, some of my friends compete at uh, athletic events in, in Port Elizabeth. And I came back the following morning and I phoned a friend of mine um, who was staying with me at the time. And I asked him if he wanted to come with me to the Vol River. Um, and we arrived there mid-afternoon. And um, after struggling to get the boat into the water, we, we were on the water about, I guess, about just before six o'clock. Um, we met some of my family and friends um, at, a, at another, another place on the water. <coughs> And on returning, um, there were a couple of people on, on my boat and um, some of them were in a rush to get back to the house to cook dinner. And so my cousin was in another boat and I suggested that they go with him um, as, as we were just trying to, we were just taking a leisure, like a, a leisurely cl cruise up the, up the river. And um, it was just my friend John and I in the boat. And at a point, um, we were just chatting and sitting and chatting. And um, at a point, he stood up to, I think, to light a cigarette or to make a phone call. And, and at that point, he shouted. And I looked forward, and I couldn't see anything. Um, the Vol River runs from east to west. And we were heading back west, so the sun was setting in front of us. And I could, I, I could only see the sun on the water. And... Uh, a couple of seconds later, um, I just remember the sound of the propeller in the, the boat. I hit the steering wheel and the propeller went into the air. I remember the sound of the engine. Um, and then when I woke up, I felt it was just hot. It was very warm in the boat. Um, it, it, it was very dark where we were. It was. Um, I remember my face was very hot and um, the boat was already half half full with water and uh, my friend John was in the front of the boat and he was busy picking up um, wallets and things or f phones and things and he, he asked me if I was okay and as he turned around down, um, I remember him looking at me and I could see that he was shocked so I, I, well my face was very hot and I grabbed my 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 kind of my face like this there was a like an itch sensation and at that point i realized that most of my face had been smashed in uh, from my nose down it was just it was pretty much just uh just uh, muscle tissue and cartilage and um i phoned my cousin uh, who was on the boat in front of us uh, i remember thinking that i needed to stay calm I phoned him and his phone just rang and I ended up phoning my uncle. Um, he wasn't there at the time, but I remember thinking if I, if I, if the boat sinks, when the boat sinks, if my phone gets damaged, at least he could keep on phoning. And so I phoned him and he picked up and I said to him that I was in a boat accident and I needed help. And um, I just remember the boat, sink, the boat sinking. I was standing on the front of the boat and the boat went under. And then I remember um, my friend John swimming with me in the water. I remember the water was hot and cold around us from all the blood. And then um, I remember being dragged onto my cousin's boat. I remember people shouting and screaming in the back. And... Um, and then I remember when the boat, I don't remember getting off the boat, but I remember walking from the boat to a car. I don't remember much of the trip in the car. And then I remember um, climbing into an ambulance. Um, and uh, my cousin was, was with us. One of my cousins was with us. She was a fifth year medical student at the time. And she um, was telling the paramedic what to do. And there was a lot of confusion. And um, I remember he gave me some injection, but when I woke up, I was um, 
I was pretty much drowning on the blood from my head injury because they had strapped me down to a stretcher. So when I woke up, um, it was to revive me and there was a lot of muscle uh, uh, tissue and blood coming out of my, my mouth and my nose. And then I don't remember anything after that. So I remember waking up. Um, I was in a, I was in, a um, in an induced coma for several days and then I woke up in hospital and, and that's that's all I remember. Was there any impact on you because of the boat accident? Uh, there was a massive impact. Um, my lady, uh, I think I was just a lot more vigilant of um, losing my life after that. I became a bit fearful. I became quite withdrawn. I remember reading in the media that I'd been drinking at the time of the accident and people were joking about it and saying, you know, that I was drunk and this and this, but they didn't understand that I nearly lost my life. Were you drinking? No, I wasn't drinking, my lady. Um, no, I just remember, I just remember being um, more serious about wanting to take my sport seriously after that. Keep you back at all in your sport? Uh, that season I ran, I, I ran the same times as I was running when I was 17. So I ran, I had a terrible season. I went to Europe. Um, Can you give me my phone? This accident was at the end of February. Um, There's something going in my, in my, in my yeah. But I had my jaw wide closed for four or five weeks. So I've lost a lot of muscle and a lot of weight. Um, I wasn't able to leave home for several weeks uh, and I had a lot of stitches. I think I had about 170 stitches in my, in my, in my face. So I just out of, out of uh, physical standpoint, it just, uh, just took a lot away from my athletic season. And by the time I got to Europe, I wasn't fit. Can I move? Can you move that back, Nana, so that I can... Mr. Pistorius, when you take your prosthesis off, how do you treat them? What do you do with them? Um, I keep them close by. I, I usually let them air at night. Um, most of the time I leave my, my, my pants on my prosthetic legs. So in other words, I can take my trousers off and to my ankles and I can take my prosthetic legs off thereafter and leave them on the ground with pants on them. Um, I usually just keep them close by. I usually put them one on top of the other. Um, and um, when I'm at training at the track, I usually put them next to my bag or I place my bag on top of them or I place my track suit on top of them. Why would you place your bag or your track suit on top of them? Um, I think it's just as an amputee, uh, it's not an uncommon thing. It's um, a prosthetic limb or a wheelchair in many disabled people. It's an extension of your body. I wouldn't leave my prosthetic legs lying around. Um, and I don't really want to be seen without them or just you know having them lie around. So I'd leave them close to my bag or in a bag. It's been an opportune time, my lady. What's, what's your time? Two. Uh, one o'clock, my lady. We shall take our lunch adjournment. Sorry, we have lunch for the